R22 Tout Monde, antenne cadiste. Merci beaucoup Lotte, merci Virginie, merci Émilie, merci Elodie, Sophie. Um, I want to begin with thanking the marvelous team behind Karkala, um, uh, especially Virginie Bobin and Lotte Arndt for their invitation and the great team at Cadiste for hosting this reading. It is hard to claim a place of one's own in Paris, but I have been privileged to claim a community of my own, a tribe, so to speak. It started at the Laboratoire d'Aubervilliers with the luminous Nat Natasha Petresin and Virginie Bobin, and I remain grateful for their generosity, friendship, and relentless support. Uh, the text in Kralkala is um, the third part of a trilogy that I have titled Be Still My Beating Heart. It was composed like a fugue in three movements or in three parts. The first two were written upon an invitation uh, to give a curator's talk at the Homeworks program in Beirut by the Zagreb-based curatorial collective VHV in 2015. The third part was written on the invitation to the conference Curating the Global, Challenges of the Present, and I forgot the rest. I just didn't know, didn't understand what they wanted and I proposed to write a short story and it worked out. Um, so the three texts uh, were really inspired or I want to cite, I mean, it's an evening of citing. Um, I will cite a man, unfortunately, but, I, but sometimes one has to. Uh, the question running, so this is a citation from an interview with Achille Mbembe in the Revue Esprit, which appeared um, in 2008 on the occasion of his publication of the book on the post-colony. <coughs> Achille says, the question running through my book is this, what is today and what are we today? What are the lines of fragility, the lines of precariousness, the fissures in contemporary African life? And possibly, how could what is be no more? How could it give birth to something else? And so, if you like, it's a way of reflecting on the fractures, on what remains of the promise of life when the enemy is no longer the colonist, in a strict sense, but the brother. So the book is a critique of the African discourse on community and brotherhood. So it can be said that it is concerned with memory only in so far as the latter is a question. First of all, of responsibility toward oneself and toward an inheritance. I'd say that memory is above all else a question of responsibility with respect to something of which one is often not the author. Moreover, I believe the one only truly, uh, I believe that one only truly becomes a human being to the degree that one is capable of answering to what one is not the direct author of, and to the person with whom one has seemingly nothing in common. There is truly no memory except in the body of commands and demands that the past not only transmits to us, but also requires us to contemplate. I suppose the past obliges us to reply in a responsible manner. So there is no memory except in the assignment of such a responsibility. <clears throat> I cite this passage because it contains several of the cardinal motifs that serve as anchors or coordinates to my own curatorial practice. Living and working in geographies of precariousness, fractured social bodies, where the enemy is the brother, rather than the outsider and, and where the futures are in ruin. Memory, responsibility, transmission, and bequeathal. These are recurring notions and questions that inform and torment how I perceive meaningful, urgent, and subversive curatorial practice. Contemporary art theory, curatorial, and artistic practice have engaged in many ways and at several levels with the complexities and the mysteries of memory, remember, remembrance, affect, archival traces, documents, rumors, hearsay, forensics, etc. In the end, the stakes lie in the act of retelling and in the reconstitution of a forgotten, silenced, or unwritten event or practice. In the course of various research projects that have preceded or shaped my curatorial 
work in film and art, I have come across situations, sometimes during interviews, where I have totally failed to find the right framework or syntax to transmit what I have been intimated. Interviews involve delicate staging. There is a form of seduction, indulging the vanity of an interview, building trust and complicity to frame the bequeathing of private information or knowledge. We always fictionalize past, present, and future. But when I have been entrusted with secrets and promised not to repeat them, the only guise in which I have been able to retell them is fiction. Fiction has afforded me the safety and the impunity to reiterate the unsayable and unlock secrets by exploring a recent past that has been severed from its facts and documentary traces. Fiction also allowed me to unbraid the complicated weave of the double language that shapes our perception of the world. The pervasive hegemonic language used by officialdom, governments, media, global corporations, and the language of our lived experience that sometimes challenges or undermines the first. So, Be Still My Beating Heart, I said, was a three a trilogy. The first part um, told the story of an artist, an Iraqi artist who's been supposedly forging paintings and selling them um, on the market in total complicity with auction houses. Um, the second uh, story imagined the diary of an Italian man who was live, an Italian Egyptian who was living in Egypt in the 40s and who was uh, working for a very wealthy Egyptian man and who basically appears in the diary of Jean Cocteau. <clears throat> when Jean Cocteau took, um, traveled with his troupe and presented a play in Alexandria, Cairo, Beirut, um, and Istanbul. And uh, I didn't know that diary existed. It doesn't appear very often in Jean Cocteau's uh, bibliography. It's called Malish. And Malish is Arabic for uh, ça va, uh, uh, laisse passer, uh, it's going to be okay, I will let it pass. And um, it's a very f funny and also infuriating diary. Um, but so this character, Carulo, appears. He's, he was assigned to handle Cocteau, who's a diva. Uh, and, um, and what I did was try to imagine uh, diary entries in... Carulo's, uh, from Carulo's point of view, as opposed to um, Cocteau. The third one is the one that appears in Kalkala, and it's, um, it's set in the present time, and it imagines a strange hostage taking in the museum, in the modern Arab, uh, the museum, the Arab Museum of Modern Art. Um, Uh, with all this talk about, um, you know, returning ISIS, Daesh uh, combatants and the question in Europe of whether they can be rehabilitated or put on trial. Um, and Qatar being um, in the doghouse, um, so I imagine that Qatar was hosting them and that somebody decided to take them to the museum. So, uh, yeah, so beginning of a thriller but um, for tonight I mean of course the obvious thing was to read that passages at least from that uh, text but lazy people like me wait for generous and affectionate invitations from beloved friends to dare an experiment and so I decided that Um, maybe I should do something else. And over the over the years of, of working as a freelancer, of frequent travel, I have been accumulating small texts that don't quite have a place to exist, that are neither material for conferences nor for serious papers or arguments. And uh, yet they, they are vital to me because they testify of my own lived experience of events that I have witnessed or observed and inform my curatorial practice at, at its core. They are, in a way, how I read images, decode poetics and signification, and perceive urgency. 
So tonight, for the first time, I want to read a series of these anecdotes or vignettes from my quotidian and that have marked me. And I think of them as the inside lining or the seams of my curatorial practice. And I thank you for your patience um, ahead of the reading. So Rabat, uh, 2004. The troupe had rehearsed in the hallways of the National Theater for weeks. They were only allowed to use the theater itself on the day before the premiere. National Theater troupe and National Theater are two distinct entities in Morocco, a tribe and a space with two separate destinies. Their national missions merge strictly on the occasion of performance. The premiere was planned to inaugurate a revisited performance of Molière's Tartuffe, restaged in vernacular in Dadija, um, and with a tribute to Bertolt Brecht. The director of the national troupe was of that generation, to whom Brecht provided a limitless wealth of imagining new representational and expressive fields. The director of the national theater was of the same generational bracket, also professed to be an adept of Brecht. Tartuffe was cast as he appears to us in all our present day world, where conservative religiosity gives moral high ground and authority for men to sermonize, censor, and minister violence and abuse. At the National Theater that night, Tartuffe was cast as one of the hordes of the commonplace fundamentalist Islamist. In honor of Brecht, he was lodged in the front rows between officials, ministers, and notables to whom front row seats are customarily reserved. He sat seemingly unobtrusive. No one took particular notice of a social agent in that demeanor, lodged in the seat in the front row. The audience of the premiere streamed in and the play opened. As the performance unraveled and everyone waited for the notorious caché ce sein que je ne saurais voir, <clears throat> a menacing man cloak, cloaked in the dress of fundamentalist rose from his seat in the front rows of the theater and shouted, Tsitri Harma, woman, cover yourself. The audience gasped and froze in horror. The man continued ranting, sermonizing, and walking towards the stage. The director of the National Theater leapt from his seat towards the security guards. His worst nightmare had become real. Islamists had invaded his theater, and officialdom was in harm's way. Tartuffe continued his performance and climbed on stage. The audience applauded. Barely a few minutes has pa had passed when the director of the National Theatre erupted back into the room, breathless and flanked by security guards brandishing their weapons. He froze as he saw the fundamentalist terrorist standing on stage in the midst of the performance. The audience exploded in laughter. <clears throat> Damascus 2005. Too many... Yusuf Abdelki ex exhibited exactly what the images of his drawings represent. Skulls of animals, dead fish, shoes, a banana, a rose, a lily, a porcelain tea set, and a fist. Exactly what the title of each drawing announces the image represents, all except for the fist. Clenched tightly, stubbornly as it were, amputated right above the elbow, the drawing's title read, Homage to the generation of the 70s. Nature Morte displayed, uh, the title of the exhibition, displayed masterful craftsmanship in cross-hatched charcoal, in sinister octaves of a chiaroscuro, darker than is warranted by the conventions of Nature Morte. The exhibition displayed in Khan Asad Basha in the heart of the Hamidiye Souq, marked Abdelki's long-awaited return to Damascus. On a first walkthrough, these seemingly unfeigned drawings left one with the unexpected chill of a muffled horror, a still fear. The scent of dread was not only evoked in the macabre echoes of the palette, but also in the serial scales of surreptitious departures from convention that the artist had undertaken. The perspective, for instance, was gently askew, enough to sidestep realism enough to betray the rules of perspective. The compositional elements were coupled uncannily, 
a dead butterfly lay next to the skull of an animal, not far from the gracefully, uh, not far from the graceful lily sprouting from a thin vase, lay a bare bone. The size of each image, either larger than customary for drawings or dispropor disproportionately tall or wide, was also a departure from convention. <clears throat> Certainly the persistent of, persistence of dead fish and the animal skull as subjects for representation, their eye sockets agape and teeth protruding, accentuated that grisly chill. On the second walkthrough, the charcoal cross-hatching seemed to have magnetic power. The rendering of the objects was realistic enough that one could still identify the form for what it was, the fish for a fish, the shoe for a shoe but they breathed with life. The fish, although dead, seemed to gaze back with the incriminating despair of a living being that was just robbed of life. The hollowed sockets of the skulls stared back as well. The masculine shoe, its broken leather exhausted from wear, its laces undone, spoke to the everyday burdens of white collar work. The feminine shoe, its uneven bulges molded from endless pain-stricken hours of wear, spoke to the temer temerarious attachment to social status. Carved from darkness, not from light, as they faintly, slowly begin to pulse with life, these commonplace objects, staged as nature morte, were emblems. The identification with the object they depicted morphed, morphed, no longer was the fish merely a fish, it was a life robbed. No longer was the skull merely a skull, but the carcass of a life caged in a closed and dark box. And the shoe no longer merely a shoe, but the outfit for, for the dream of a life with dignity postponed, worn out. Signifiers morph, morphed into signifieds. The fish, the lily, the shoe, and the dainty porcelain set began to unravel other identifications. They resurrected ed echoes of what they represented in essence, that frozen, frightful moment of bearing witness to lives being robbed, lives imprisoned in dark boxes, and dreams expired to a last sigh from obeying to the rules of a system. The shoe was no longer a shoe one had seen, a shoe one knew, a shoe one owned. It became the emblem of what one had always been too scared to see, the representation of one's life anonymous, dispirited from one's subservience to a system that swallows human beings and turn, turns them into anodyne emblems. The, that system where grace and beauty, such as the lithe and proud lily, cannot be dissociated from the death of some other life. These are not charcoal renderings of nature morte. They are visual representations of the metaphorical power of emblems. Far from being morte, they are thumped, they thumped with a life at the liminal edge of death, which stubbornly refuses to surrender. A life haunting to bear witness, unmask, attest. Nothing was what it seemed to be, except for the singular drawing of the fisted hand, titled explicitly as, a, as an homage to the art, uh, from the artist to the generation of the 70s. Its power was allegorical, its story told by all the other drawings in the show. The fist was defiantly stiff its muscles and veins tightened with a fierce strength, despite the fact of its amputation. The generation of the 70s in Syria, broken, humiliated, defeated, exiled, jailed, tortured, killed, betrayed, still had the fight in its soul, its fist yet to be undone, its body rendered to carcasses, skulls, shoes, will always be haunting with its incriminating gaze. On the night of the opening of the exhibition, thousands streamed in from all walks of life. Among the thousands were hundreds of that generation from the, from the 70s who traveled from all over the country to come and pay tribute to their brother in arms. Yusuf Abdelke, jailed numerous times for his political beliefs, had been forced into exile 25 years earlier. 
this exhibition of drawings was the first occasion for his return. Writing in Mulhaq al-Nahar, Muhammad Ali Atasi tried to count the years robbed from their collective lives spent in detention. He titled his piece, A Thousand Years in Detention and Hope Under the Same Roof. One after the other, they took pictures of themselves with him, their hands clutched together, their fists hugging warmly against the background of ashen renderings that dared to represent what had been forbidden from representation. And the final vignette is Beit Din, 2016. Her long curly red hair seemed like a mane on fire under the projectors. She dyed it in red. It amplified the aura of a diva. Lena Shamamian was born in Aleppo to Armenian survivors of the genocide that, but had been living in Paris for a few years. A well-known soprano, she sang in Arabic and Armenian. The range of her repertoire was impressive. It extended from classical Arabic music, traditional Armenian folk song, and Western opera. The year was 2000, 2016. I was with my family, attending her concert at the Beit Din Festival in the Lebanese mountains. Aleppo was under siege, and Lebanon hosted more than a million Syrian refugees, the largest bulk of whom lived in camps, in tents. After the first song, she spoke in Arabic. Her accent was distinct. She evoked Aleppo under siege. Lebanon's population, including the Armenian communities, is divided over taking sides in the Syrian conflict. Almost half support the Assad regime and the other half wants to see him unseated. Finished. There was no way to decrypt the political leanings of the audience. Shamamian's repertoire was rarely political or polarizing anyway. There was unspoken consensus, however, that the, that the 1.1 million refugees were a genuine burden on the country's economy and political future, even though international aid dispersed through Lebanese organizations had actually generated concrete benefits. After the third song, Shamamian posed and told us that she wanted to sing an old Armenian folk song, a cappella. Her voice dropped an octave. It was grave, somber, and lamenting. And when the refrain came, she translated one sentence to English. Soon we will be gone over the mountains. I was intrigued by her choice of lament. For Armenians, the promise of return is so crucial because it anchors their identity and keeps the memory of the genocide and forced displacement alive. Their national mountain, almost sacred, is Mount Ararat. I sensed, however, that the audience did not see her as an Armenian, but rather as a refugee from the ruins of Aleppo, who was promising them all that all refugees would be going home soon. The daughter of children of survivors of genocide had flown all the way from Paris, dyed her hair red, sung songs to lull the elite of a country in tatters, suddenly transformed into a refugee, ashamed to have overstayed, promising her benefactors that soon she and the other million refugees would go home across the mountain. Thank you. Thank you.